would like to begin to express my um, congratulations, first of all, to the team for the um, organization of the symposium. And also, um, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Anna Nomuska. I come from Struga, North Macedonia, and I am a student at the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences at the American University of Europe FON. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a very interesting, uh, according to my opinion, topic, and my presentation is uh, on the topic of the structural social inequality and the social conflict. Um, we have gathered here today and in the upcoming few days to talk about risks. Um, the sole title of the event is Risk Society, Rethinking Uncertainties in a Globalized World. And each of the speakers will try to pay attention to a particular risk as a source of uncertainty. So I would like to begin by providing a working definition for the risk. Uh, most simply, the risk is defined as an uncertainty, a possibility of a bad outcome. The contemporary world is filled with risks of all kinds, environmental, political, legal, economic, financial, social, and so on. Hence, the secret of upholding our society stable lies in the successful management of all these risks. Generally, we can speak of two types of risks, individual and societal. While the individual risk is one affecting only one person due to the specific circumstances they're in, the societal risk, on the other hand, affects the society as a whole. The two categories are, however, interwined, and all societal risks eventually individualize themselves and become individual risks for every member of our society. Therefore, um, the societal risks are greater, they affect more people, and are an overall source of uncertainty. If the conditions for the realization of the risk occur, then that will lead to a negative impact for every society member. The best way to prevent such societal catastrophes begin with understanding the risk. What causes it? What is its essence? How does it occur? And today, I chose to elaborate upon a specific type of risk, the social inequality. Um, to begin with, even though the modern liberal tendencies focus on ideas such as the individualizations and eventually lead to an atomized society, um, as human beings, we are naturally prone to living in a community with other such human beings. Um, doing so requires some form of organization of our relations. And now, whether these relations are perceived as relations among equals or not, has a lot to do with the type of societal structure we create. Um, equality among societal members is not upheld as a major principle, then the members become competitive for societal resources that leads to instability and uncertainty, both of which can lead to the degeneration of the society into a system of oppression among the socially unequal groups. Social inequality in this sense is a risk that can easily give birth to the social conflict and a lot of antagonisms. In order to understand this, it is good to begin at the very basis. Um, humanity has done much in the realm of the human rights and equality in particular, especially after the Second World War. The modern states have united behind the common goal of ensuring the basic human rights for all persons, among which the right to equality. The common orientation has found its place in many international documents, uh, treaties, and other legal acts. And in that sense, the Universal Declaration for Human Rights declares that, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood, end quote. Following the tone set in the Universal Declaration, our contemporary view of equality is postulated upon the concept of the moral equality, meaning that each person has the equal amount of moral value and worth and is entitled to equal respect. The concept of, I'm sorry, the concept of equality has been a subject of debate and controversy since the beginning of mankind. It has troubled the minds of great philosophers, um, historians, politicians, and ordinary men, starting from the famous ancient three, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Justinian, and the Roman legalists, um, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Rawls, and Marx, and even Nietzsche. If we open our high school philosophy textbook, I believe that we cannot pinpoint one single author that does not have an opinion on equality. So let's begin by conceptualizing it. 
equality or equal signifies a quantitative, a qualitative relationship, a correspondence between a group of different objects, persons, processes, or circumstances that have the same qualities in at least one respect, one specific feature, therefore with differences in other features. In this sense, equality necessarily generates one question, equal in what respect? What feature are they equal? Every comparison, therefore, presumes a tetrium comparationis, the concrete attribute defining the respect in which the equality applies. This relevant comparative standard represents a variable. In the realm of the social sciences following this variable, equality would mean a correspondence between two different individuals referring to their status as human beings. In other words, Regardless of certain qualities such as age, gender, religious or political affiliation, race, nationality, or any aspect of their identity for that matter, these two persons will have the same status as human beings. They will have the same amount of moral value and dignity. To summarize this in a working definition, equality is a state of affairs in which all the members of the society are sharing an equal status as human beings. Now, since we have an overview of the general concept of equality, the next step is to tighten it in the social realm. The question of social equality is closely related to the concept of the social justice. Only to get an overview, I'm going to refer to Hudson, who defines the social justice as the fair distribution of opportunities and rewards, responsibilities within the society, as well as the existence of principles and institutions for the distribution of meaningful social goods, such as income, shelter, food, health, education, and so on. Social justice has emerged in its modern conceptualizations out of the inequities that heaped on the mid 19th century European working class by the capitalist mode of production. Hence, the presence of inequality in the 1800s posed a risk to societal stability and resulted in the emergence of a new concept that was seeking to elevate inequality and therefore mitigate the risk of a societal catastrophe. At this point, um, I believe that we are already getting a sense of what the social equality means. It is a state of affairs, again, where the members of the various societal groups within the society are attributed an equal moral status as human beings, but also have an equal share and an equal access of the social goods. Combining the concept of equality and the social justice results in this specific type of social equality. In a purely egalitarian, in a purely equal society, every citizen would be equally able to contribute to the overall well being of that society, and they will be equally able to benefit from their membership within that society. The presence, on the other hand, of social inequality or the absence of such social justice posed in the past and poses still in the, uh, in the present, but also in the future, a threat, a risk to the stability of the societal relations. This then uh, logically trans translates to structured and recurrent pattern of unequal distributions of goods, the wealth, the opportunities, the rewards, and the punishments among the members of the different societal groups that are defined either through their age, ethnicity, wealth, religious and political affiliation, but also other forms of um, uh, or other forms of characteristics. Nelson Mandela held a very striking view, saying that the social equality is the only basis for human happiness. And he was, in fact, actually not far from the truth because social equality is a state of affairs in which all the human beings have equal rights, they have equal liberties and status, and they can equally access to the public goods and the social services. To further this on, the social equality in its essence means the absence of enforced social classes. I believe that we now have a clear overview over the theoretical conceptions of equality, social equality and inequality. To understand, however, how does the societal inequality pose a risk to the society as a whole, we need to pause the theoretical analysis just for a while. It is time for a quick reality check. 
has our global society actually achieved social justice? To which extent can we say that we live in a social equality? Luckily, this isn't another philosophical dilemma and can be answered rather simply as most of the aspects of the social inequality are quantitative and therefore measurable. Um, in order to lay down the case of social equality or inequality to you, I'm going to use data provided by the OECD, Oxfam, and inequality.org. I'm going to start as recently as the past year. Oxfam reports that from March 18th to the end of 2020, global billionaire wealth increased by $3.9 trillion. By contrast, global workers' combined earnings fell by $3.7 trillion, according to the International Labor Organization, as millions lost their jobs around the world. According to data from the WHO, the World Health Organization, and the World Bank, in mid-January 2022, the number of vaccine doses administered per 100 people was almost than 13 times higher in high income than in low income countries. According to the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, the world's richest 1% with more than $1 million owns 45.8% of the world's wealth, while adults with less than $10,000 in wealth make up 55% of the world's population, but hold 1.3% of the global wealth. According to Forbes, the world's 10 richest billionaires own an astonishing $1,448 trillion in combined wealth, a sum greater than the total goods and services most nations produce on an annual basis. And according to the 2021 Forbes ranking, the globe is home to 2,755 billionaires. Those with extreme wealth, such as the billionaires we mentioned before, have often accumulated their fortunes on the backs of people around the world who work for poor wages and under dangerous conditions. According to Oxfam, the wealth divide between the global billionaires and the bottom half of humanity is steadily growing. Between 2009 and 2018, the number of billionaires it took to equal the wealth of the world's poorest 50% fell from 380 to only 26. OECD statistics show that the top 1% in the United States holds 40.5% of the national wealth. The most visible wealth inequality in America today may be the Forbes magazine list of the nation's 400 richest. In 2018, the three men at the top of that list, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, and the investor Warren Buffett, held combined fortunes worth more than the total wealth of the poorest half of Americans. The average income of the richest 10% of the population is about nine times that of the poorest 10% across the OECD. Women earn 16% less than men and female top earners are paid 21% less than their male counterparts. A person with low income and with the same level of healthcare needs as a rich person is less likely to see a specialist doctor. The gap between the rich and the poor is 12 percentage points on average across the OECD and the European Union countries. When accessing the health system, nearly 17% of the households in the European Union declare that they have difficulties in affording care. But this proportion stands at 30% for those below the poverty line. Everywhere, households in the bottom income quantile are more likely to incur a catastrophic health spending. People in the top 20% of the income distribution still earn more than five times more than the people in the bottom 20%. Are the numbers starting to make you feel busy? Well, yes, they should. I can continue listing statistical data, but I believe that my point is clear. The answer to the question, has the world achieved social equality is no. 
This leads the discussion to another question, naturally painful and troubling for the social sciences. Why? And answering this one requires a bit more patience and hard work as it eventually leads us to the field of the structural and systemic social inequality. Before I talk much on systemic and structural social inequality, I'm going to make a conceptual digression. I believe it is important to make a distinction between the formal and the material realm of the social equality. Achieving equality has been, as we saw in the beginning of this talk, a common goal for nations worldwide. This has led to much legal and political action, adopting anti-discrimination laws, sanctioning and criminalizing discrimination, promoting equality constitutionally, adopting and ratifying conventions, declarations, and other acts upholding the principle of equal treatment and non-discrimination. On a first glance, this might seem as if we have achieved the long desired equality, as if each person is nominally equal to any other person in the world, they're given the same rights, they have equal access to the institutions and are equal before the law. Any form of inequality or discrimination, such as racism or sexism, will be called upon and sanctioned by the state. If we analyze the formalities, the world is a utopia. However, we don't usually live by the law books in our day-to-day -day lives and our daily experiences show us that equality is in fact scarce. The material aspect of equality actually shows us how much equality we have in reality. Or in other words, how have the states actually implemented equality? And this is where we go back to the numbers I elaborated before. They show us how much, if at all, we are really equal. This brings us to the need to find out what creates such an enormous discrepancy between the formal and the material state of affairs. For such a complex question, the answer is rather simple. It's the system. Okay, yes, I am aware that the simple uh, answer raised even more questions. I will go step by step here as we have finally moved into the field of the structural and systemic social inequality. Very often, the reasons for inequality are woven. They are embedded into the very fabric of our society and what more are being upheld by the system that we live in. To keep in mind the fact that we are analyzing the social inequality from a risk standpoint, its very existence means that the ground for the societal relations is rather shaky and can easily perpetuate into a social conflict or a crisis on a societal level. Structural systemic inequality is defined as a condition where one category of people is attributed an unequal status in relation to other categories of people. This relationship is then perpetuated and reinforced by a confluence of unequal relations and roles, functions, decisions, rights, and opportunities. When the structural inequality becomes structural social inequality, it means that the relations between the members of the two societal groups are never relations between two individuals, but rather relations between oppressor and oppressed. The existence of societal groups has been the centerpiece of the theory of structural and while there are many views as to how do these groups form, in the light of the distribution of the social welfare, it is natural for us to step into the classism as a subcategory of structuralism. Now, classism perceives the different societal groups as classes. In other words, the structure of the society is a class structure. Logically and naturally, this implies the existence of an upper class and a lower class as well as some form of a middle class. Following this line of thought, the members of one class have an equal social status and are attributed an equal amount of social welfare among themselves as a group, as a class, and their status differs from the status of the members of the other societal group, the other class. According to the Marxist school of thought, which is the most dominant school in the realm of classism, the class is a group with a common relationship towards the means of production or the means to produce wealth. So the upper class, which Karl Marx names as the bourgeois, owns the means of production and controls the production of wealth, while the lower class, the proletariat, owns only their labor and sells it as a means of existence. To simplify it, we can think of this in terms of factory owners and workers, of landlords and farmers, etc. 
This configuration results in a relationship that the upper class will always have oppression over the lower class and will have an overall control over every aspect of the social life due to their advanced position. Today, living in the post-industrialist era, the structure of the classes is changed, might have changed, but the relation between them is a constant. Even in the 21st century, in the globalized world that we live in, there is always an upper class that has control over the social, the economic, the political processes that owns the wealth, and a lower class that has to work for wage in order to survive. This form of structuralism is embedded in the very core of our society and our system, and is therefore the main cause for structural and systemic social inequality. As I mentioned before, the systemic social inequality is being upheld by the system. This means that the statistical info that shows us that the richest 20% own five times more than the people in the lowest 20% is not a coincidence. The natural and even reflexive thought that most people and most of us will have at this point can be framed something like this. If the state used synonymously for the system recognizes the social inequality as a risk for the societal stability and therefore undertakes legal and political action to address it, how then can we say that this very system actually at the same time upholds it? To begin with, the neoliberal and the neo-capitalist system of today addresses the idea of the personal freedom understood negatively as the absence of governmental intervention one can define it as a laissez-faire system. This gives the governments a very limited scope of action. As was previously shown, the societal structure of such a state is based on various societal groups concerning the various demographic characteristics, women, children, people with uh, special needs, LGBT community, etc. However, since we're analyzing the social aspect only, the minimal, the neoliberal and the neo-capitalist state has its citizens divide on societal groups perceived simply as classes. Even though this state has, let's say, ratified tens of international documents promoting equality, has its own anti-discrimination laws and policies, all the formal action is being implemented on an already classed society where the members of the different classes do not have an equal start. This leads us to a very important aspect of the discussion, the link between the structural social inequality and wealth. As we saw until now, uh, the social inequality in general and the structural social inequality is most dominantly based on the distribution of wealth, the amount of financial and material resources among the The social inequality roots from the wealth inequality. Wealth inequality, also known as the wealth gap, is a measure between the wealth, especially the difference between the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor in a given country, a demographic group, or society, as we're speaking right now in general. Wealth inequality is very closely related to the income inequality, which tracks the money people earn. However, wealth inequality includes not just the income, but also the value of the bank accounts, the investments, the homes and the personal possessions, such as cars or let's say jewelry, artwork and other valuables. And wealth inequality is a major cause of the unequal living standards in many communities. And therefore it is the underlying cause of the social inequality. The Gini index or the Gini coefficient is a statistical measure of the wealth distribution developed by the Italian statistician Corrado Gini. And the Gini index is used to gauge the economic inequality by measuring the income distribution or the wealth distribution. Coefficient ranges from zero to 800 in percent or from zero to 100 percentages. A coefficient of zero represents perfect equality, a society in which all the members have an equal amount of wealth. Or, noting back to the discussion of the societal structure, a society with a Gini coefficient equal to zero would mean that the members of this society are all given a completely equal social status. 
and this refers to the absence of classes or any form of social status based on groups for that matter. The closer to one or 100% the coefficient is, the greater the wealth inequality and the wider the wealth gap is. Again, in terms of the social structure, a Gini coefficient equaling to one means the presence of unequal wealth distribution, where one societal group acquires enormous amounts and the other diametrically opposite acquiring none. The top 10 countries, as we can see on this slide, with the highest wealth inequality according to the World Bank Gini index are South Africa with 63%, Namibia with 59.1%, Suriname with 57.9%, Zambia with 57.1%, Ottoman Principe with 56.3%, the Central African Republic with 56.2%, Estuani with 54.6%, Mozambique with 54%, Brazil with 53.4%, Botswana with 53.3%. The South African wealth inequality has become worse over the years. And when we are speaking about this, the most, syn the most synonymous country for wide wealth inequality is always South Africa. The top 1% of the earners take home almost 20% of the income. And the top 20%, top 10%, I'm sorry, take home 65%. That means that the 90% of South African earners take home only 35 of all the income in the country. Incomes in South Africa remain to be racialized, gender, and spatialized, meaning that white people are more likely to find work and work that pays better than their black counterparts. Female workers, on the other hand, uh, own uh, only 30% less than female workers. The urban workers earn the double that of those in the countryside. For many countries in Africa, the income inequality is rooted in their economic structures in which a few high income sectors generate significant wealth, but only a small number of people, leaving the vast majority of the workforce trapped in lower income sectors. This inequality is often exacerbated by inadequate educational systems that fail to prepare all but the richest of the citizens for better paying skilled jobs and the presence of the oppressive government. Additionally, while many countries in the Eastern and Southern Africa enjoy a high concentration of resources, both natural and human, many other African countries, for example, lack even the basic resources such as arable land or clean water, which can hamper the overall economic growth. The top 10 countries with the lowest wealth inequality, on the other hand, according to the World Bank Gini Index are, surprisingly, Slovenia with 24.6%, the Czech Republic, 25%, Slovakia, again, 25%, Belarus with 25.3%, Moldova with 25.7%, the United Arab Emirates with 26%, Iceland, 26.1%, Azerbaijan with 26.7%, Ukraine with 26.6%, and Belgium with 27.2%. The numbers are dating from 2022 ranking. Top 10 countries are located in Europe. The top one take home only 12% of the total income, and the bottom 50% of earners take 22% of the income. For comparison, in the United States, which has more billionaires than any other country, the top 1% of earners take about 20% of income, and the bottom 50% of earners take only 10% of the income. The less inequality or the greater equality in Europe is attributed to the fact that Europe has not let its market economy become a market society, where market forces all the other areas of society, such as education, iron health, and wages. Examples are system and the more favorable labor market. This means that the less market economy system have to exist and even expand, the upper class will be able to progress up, accumulating more and more wealth. The lower class either accumulates wealth or even more. The minimum does not have to do much about this. 
Moving forward, the dominant wage system results in exploitation of the workers due to the fact that the main tool for creating this wealth is employed labor. The idea of the maximization of wealth results in enormous levels of exploitation. These few aspects result in something that the sociologists label as wealth. In other words, the two classes hold different amounts of wealth. This transcends wealthing into the other spheres of life. The wealthy class is able to afford more than the lower class. Wealth opens doors to better education, which means that the wealthier class will be able to be more educated than the lower. The healthier class is the to, be, to afford more expensive options. Other areas of social inequality, voting rights, freedom of speech and assembly, the extent of property rights and the access of education, healthcare, quality, traveling, transportation, vacationing, and other social parallels are endless. The economic power attributed to the due to the amount of wealth allows them for a great wealth. With power comes benefit. The group, the class, is to acquire the best group with resources. And when this tendency lasts longer and is done to prevent it, the members of the two groups consistently get richer and their lives even but the lives of others gets more complicated. This structural configuration based on of the social justice postulated on social inequality causes the society and create different positions. It creates classes that are all Our and hypothesis social inequality, social stability. I would let here the structural configuration and has our society and our world the here and oppression among human beings. The possibility of something bad. So what could First, our global society being. Sorry, uh, can you please uh, try to stop the video, to turn off the camera, because we have some technical problems here. I can't hear you well when you are talking. So maybe just to try to turn off the camera. Well, now? It's probably something with connections. I mean, yes, you may. Mama is not okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's the internet connection. Um, okay, but I made in the depth for a reason. In theory. Uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Quality. We can hear you well. It's still something with connection. Better. Okay, can you just try to talk more to see if it will be okay? Okay. Um, um, uh, uh, but, um, if I my opening argument and the hypothesis that inequality is risk, that would lead me back here. The structural configuration that they had um, 
and our world a source and hierarchy and oppression. I define the risk as a possibility could be worse global based on an attack. I made a Marxist application in addition of well, Karl Marx is the founder of a very in the realm of the social inequality, the structural social that I would like. Our members of the social into society always interact on the rather than of conflict. I'm sorry, I'm sorry of we have the same problem. So maybe if you can try uh, to reconnect or something like that. Because we have the same problem when you are talking, it's not really clear. We cannot understand you. Maybe you can try to uh, go out and then come back at the same at the session. Okay, can you hear me now better? Yeah, you can try okay. to talk, but it seems better now. Okay, uh, pardon me for the uh, unstable connection once again. Um, I was going to go back to the re to revisiting once again the opening argument. Um, the social inequality is in fact a risk for the societal stability, and that leads us back here. The structural configuration that roots from inequality and has become the core of our society and our world is a source of the Latin hierarchy and oppression among equal human beings. I defined the risk as a possibility of something bad happening. Well, what could be worse than our whole global society being based on an antagonism? I made a Marxist implication in the definition of the classes for a reason. Well, Karl Marx is the founder of a very interesting theory in the realm of the social inequality or even more concretely, the structural social inequality that I would like to revisit. And the theory of the social conflict argues that the members of the various social classes within the society interact on the basis of conflict rather than consensus. Through various forms of conflict, groups will tend to attain differing amounts of material and non-material resources. The more powerful groups will tend to use their power in order to retain power and exploit groups with less power. Now, since the amount of resources is scarce and limited, the conflict is perpetual. The social conflict results in the unequal distribution of the welfare. However, it does not stop with wealth. As we saw, wealth brings social and political power, which means that the upper class will be represented better in politics, will have a bigger influence on policies and laws. This means that the antagonism will not remain in the realm of wealth, but it will transverse in all other aspects of our daily lives. The class conflict theory has had its share of criticism, of course, mostly by liberals and libertarians. It has been said that a global society is built on merit, that the legal and political systems promote equal rights and uphold the individual as their most precious value. Again, reality paints a very, very different picture. One where the class conflict is very real, but also deeply hidden under the liberal layer, layers. This is why when analyzing the risks of our society, we should not and must not leave out the social inequality. Before I jump into the last part of my discussion, a quick summary of the key points. Social equality most broadly means the absence of enforced social class or the achievement of the same status among people. The data and the daily experiences show us that while formally and nominally, Nations worldwide have ensured a legal standpoint for the equal status among human beings. Realistically, in the social realm, there is a lot of inequality rooting from the distribution of wealth. This, however, is no coincidence. 
as the system that we live in has the preconditions for the asymmetric relations embedded within. So with such a complex structure and interrelation, is it really possible to combat the social inequality? Well, the answer is an optimistic yes. It only takes strong will and dedication. The first step is the deconstruction of the egoistic mentality. This means that as humanity, we must work towards the development of compassion and understanding that our individual advancement must not be achieved through putting anyone else down. The individualistic mentality developed by the modern tendencies atomized the society and created a plentiful field for egoism. We must undo this and understand that we are inevitably linked with society and everyone else within it. Another step is the deconstruction of the classes. In order to achieve equality and equity in terms of equality of the outcome, the world must minimize the gap. This is achieved through a strong redistribution policy, starting from progressive taxation, social benefits and low income households and social state provided support for the less wealthy. Creating better laboring policies that would promote workers' rights, make unionizing mandatory and union busting illegal. Affordable housing and food through a sufficient amount of governmental control. Public health care and public education so that these two will be available for everyone at an equal level. Higher levels of public participation or the enforcement of a direct democracy for all essential questions so that the essential decisions are made by the majority rather than the political elite. All these activities must happen globally as the structural social inequality is a global problem and a source for uncertainty on a global level. Only united can the world address it. Every process, action, policy, or occurrence that has the potential to harm our society in any way negatively influence our social balance is to be perceived as a risk. I hope that through this discussion, I have given enough arguments for us to revisit the structural and systemic social inequality as a risk, a very real one indeed, due to the fact that the unequal access and the distribution of the social welfare upon the already scarce resources and wealth leads to an imbalance of power and creates a class conflict, an antagonism that is a threat to societal stability, locally, nationally, and globally. Terry Eagleton says that genuine equality means not treating everyone the same, but attending equally to everyone's different needs. So my final remark would be that to achieve the social equality, we must deconstruct the system that thrives on oppression. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the beginning. Um, I want to ask you maybe, uh, do you know um, some predictions uh, for the future, maybe how it will go uh, with uh, this inequality in society? Because at the beginning of your presentation, we saw how it looked like before 10, 15 years. So do we know how it can be in the future and um, what we can change maybe uh, in that future? Um, thank you for the question. A very interesting one indeed. Um, I will go back to the um, to the actually suggestions that I made in my presentation. What can we do to combat inequality? Um, during the pandemic, we've seen uh, a lot of changes in all the social interactions that were happening um, in our uh, daily lives, that were happening in uh, the countries worldwide, um, on the Balkans as well. What we saw here was that the wealth gap was very huge during the uh, pandemic. We've seen that in the present times, the wealth gap is very big. While once we're able to afford, uh, let's say, uh, only the public uh, healthcare systems, and therefore there were a lot of um, the victims of the um, a, a lot of victims of the Corona crisis. On the other hand, the wealthy, the wealthier class of the of the groups uh, were was able to afford better um, better healthcare options. Uh, this inequality is expected to expand in the future, uh, both due to the economic crisis that the world is in right now and due to the um, uh, actually military and uh, pandemic that we are in right now. The predictions according to the World Bank and the predictions according to the uh, national uh, st uh, reporting statistics are that the inequality is to expand in the future even more. 
that is why the action that I uh, promoted, the action that I suggested in the presentation, the changes in policies, the changes in laws that are uh, supposed to be undertaken is actually very, very urgent. If we uh, manage to leave out this question as it is right now, the only thing that we'll be seeing in the future is that the poor are, the poor are going to get poorer and the rich are going to get richer. This is why the governments must act towards a better redistribution policy because um, as the tendency goes, uh, and to, uh, to the end of 2030, it is expected that uh, global wealth will be increased, but it will be uh, given in the hands of only a very uh, small amount of the small number of individuals. We've seen that only three people in the United States are uh, holding uh, only around a half of the national wealth. And on a global level, the numbers are even worse, and they're starting to get worse and worse on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is why the nation, national governments, the national assemblies must take action very urgently. And in the Balkans, um, in Macedonia, and in the uh, post um, Yugoslav countries, we're seeing that this disparities are big and are also um, given a uh, overall low standard of living. So. Uh, as I said, the action is urgent and we must undertake it as fast as possible and everyone must contribute to it. Thank you so much. We will check if there is any question in the audience, maybe. Okay. Um, so my question would be, uh, you mentioned that inequality was a global problem. And we saw some maps, uh, I mean, uh, the African statistics that basically showed that before it's a global problem, it's also a problem of each continent separately. So my question would be, do you think that the EU uh, is um, the closest thing that we have to a unifying institution on our continent? And should it uh, play uh, an important role in getting rid of the inequality? And is it doing enough to uh, stop it? Um, the European Union, as you mentioned, is a very uh, important step forward. Um, as, uh, as, as we can see, the beginnings of the European Union are in fact, um, let's say, uh, pushing to an economic reconciliation after the World War II. Um, in the European Union, the numbers, as we saw in the, uh, in the map that I showed you before, the European Union numbers are very much more stable than in the rest of the world. This is actually a signal that the European Union is doing something good. Um, what is happening there is that the uh, mm, control over the market and the control over the distribution of the resources on a European, European Union level is actually promoting the equality. Uh, if we are taking an analysis on a much wider level, how the, the resources need to be dis distributed, uh, which nation needs to produce what, and how are what the nation produces going to be um, distributed among the citizens on a more um, on a more uh, let's say um, on a more different uh, on a more global level. This means that the European Union Union is actually contributing towards this which shows us that the numbers, as I mentioned before, are actually in fact showing us that the European Union is signaling something good. So we need global action because one country itself cannot combat the social inequality. What we need is a global action. And um, even on a European un Union level, this is good. If we expand it and then the European Union engages in an international action, uh, combating uh, the social inequality, then the results are going to get much big, much greater and much more, um, much, much better for us as citizens. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there maybe any other questions? Okay, you can. Uh, should I come closer or can uh, people no, hear I, me? I think it can. Yeah, she can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you well. Okay, okay. Uh, great. Uh, so my question would be maybe closer to some terminological nature of uh, what you try to establish here. So when we talk about equality and the wealth distribution, I believe you are correct about stating that uh, the current state of the wealth distribution could create serious conflicts and risks in contemporary society. Uh, however, I would uh, maybe, when we talk about this, uh, try to refrain from uh, conceptualizing equality in such a deep uh, sense of things. 
For instance, when we talk about equality, I believe the ultimate equality in the egalitarian sense is not necessarily the most productive idea to strive towards. Because equality in its broader sense uh, can, if it's with it's some data style of what we should strive towards, uh, generate a certain level of uh, mediocrity. For instance, I mean, if we try to, you know, group the most successful and least successful people together and make them be everything equal, the thing we get is basically you know, mediocrity. You know, we don't have this level of evolution, we don't have this level of progress, and all the capacities, all of the available advancements we could achieve. But rather, what I would like to point out as relevant factor in all of this, in this generated conflict you mentioned also, is the middle class of a society. So in every society, we have the upper class, which is the richest, we have the middle class, and we have the lower class. So yeah, this uh, upper class is currently advancing and generating a lot of wealth, and everything is going into a direction which they can generate more and more wealth. But to me, the most relevant phenomenon that is going on is not necessarily the thing that they are, uh, you know, just accumulating more and more wealth in the upper class. What I see as the most dangerous thing in this is that the middle class is substantially disappearing. So in this upper class, it's expanding a little, a very little, but it's also a little bit expanding. But I think we have is the middle class is turning into the bottom class. This discrepancy is creating a certain polarization, a certain <coughs> which could hypothetically be the best way to interpret, to interpret these risks uh, we're dealing with today. And the relevance of having the stable middle class can be targeted in various, in many authors. I mean, I even remember reading Aristotle has said that the health of a nation can be measured by the width of its middle class, because you know, if you have only the upper class and the bottom class, I mean, conflict will generally arise. But if you have the middle class, which can you know have this mobility to do, if they fail, if they do bad, they can turn to the bottom, or if they do good, they can turn to the top. You know, you have this mobility, you know, society is stable, there isn't necessarily a risk of conflict. So to me, uh, when I look at this data, I believe we should uh, all try to see, you know, how middle class is standing here and uh, see how uh, this affects, you know. Uh, destabilize them, uh, deny the opportunities of the middle class people and turn them either to the bottom or very few of them to the top. This is maybe the, the most substantial element which we can map in talking about this uh, war in a sense. And it's uh, maybe, you know, some form of old belief. We don't necessarily strike from complete egalitarianism because you know that, again, this is necessarily the most productive way to go, but we also don't strive towards, you know, complete, um, I don't know, oligarchy. Or something like that, because um, you know it's in the middle. You know the middle class should exist and should have a certain mobility. Uh, that's maybe a substantial factor which can uh, determine the stability of a society, and in which can cause you know to have uh, certain risks and hazards, catches or not. Thank you. Um, thank you. A very, in very interesting and very correct remark indeed. Um, as I, I hope you have. Um, grasp this through the throne of the presentation that I have mentioned the existence of an upper and a lower class that uh, supposedly suggests that somewhere in between there, there should be a middle class. However, the statistical data does not show us the existence of any middle class. It only shows us a very few people in the upper class and a very large number of people, the mass is in the lower class. Um, this form of oppression is actually very negative for the society. You mentioned that the, um, the, 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 the social position of a country can be measured through the social position of the middle class. However, since we have the absence of such a middle class, since we can locate which people are um, actually being part of this middle class, this shows us that the discrepancy is getting enormous. Uh, this is why the redistribution policy is necessary. We need to get the um, unrightly, um, unrightly, or let's say, accumulated wealth held by the upper class, and therefore redistribute it in order to um, upgrade and up uphold the lower class, the, the bottom class of the um, of the society, and also create or get back this middle class. Um, I have never uh, actually uh, seen a larger discrepancy than in the past. Um, our national data, uh, the data from the Republic of Macedonia, show us that the, the, the middle class is actually practically inexistent. And since that is on a national level, I can only imagine what happens on a global level. Uh, we need to get back the middle class. We need to create a middle class because um, 
the existence of a middle class lowers the discrepancy between the upper class and the lower class. Since we don't have this middle class, then the discrepancy is enormous. The difference is enormous. This results in difference in the standard. This results in difference in the um, in the uh, let's say the, the way of life, the way of uh, accessing health benefits, the way of accessing the public education or the private education, etc. Uh, what I believe here is uh, that. Um, as, as I mentioned, there is no middle class. There are only workers and there are only the uh, factory owners. So while the factory owners can nominally be attributed to the upper class, the workers are always attributed to the uh, lower class. Um, this is why the redistribution policies are very important. A very interesting remark you made saying that um, the, the inexistence of the middle class actually show us how much the discrepancy is big. If we measure uh, how many countries can actually nominally, uh, not practically, but nominally do have a middle class, the numbers will be very small. Even in the United States of America, which we usually consider as the most liberal, the most uh, the most wealthy, the, the most beneficial society in the world, and is usually used as synonymous for this, the discrepancies actually show us that the middle class is nowhere to be seen. And that is a trend in the Balkans, that is a trend in Europe, that is a trend all over the world. If we leave our society to be postulated only upon two groups of people, the extremely wealthy, and being that a minority, and the extremely poor being a majority, then the society is at risk of collapse. One way or another, the society will be turned upside down. It will either be a very large, no large numbers of poverty, very huge amounts of poverty, or it will be some form of a social conflict, an uprising or whatever. We have seen in the past um, examples of how much this discrepancy has affected the societal stability. If we put the parameters of the contemporary society, if we put the parameters of globalization, I can only um, imagine how much of a world, global, and societal catastrophe it would be if we don't act to bring back, as you mentioned, the middle class immediately. Thank you. Um, and we saw that Professor Van Loon also raised his hand, so we give him a word. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it was a very interesting presentation, and uh, I was wondering, I was wondering how it how it can be that the uh, majority of Americans still think they're middle class, or put it differently, how did this how did this happen? How did this happen that we live in a world in which inequality is is increasing, and people seem to think that they are not affected by it or, or something like that. And so that is the question about causality, right? So what causes this? And then my question to you, because you said at the end, well, you know, there is a reason to be optimistic because I have a solution. <laughs> Here it is. Why don't you do this? And then my question to you is, why don't people vote for that? Right? Because your solution has been around for, uh, for 150 years or so, and people don't vote for it. And I'm not trying to be cynical. But I think the whole problem is if you present inequality as somehow something that happens, this happens, the economy works like this, and we need to compensate, then you take away one very important aspect. Namely, some people want this to happen. Some people actually do politics for this to happen. And they are very happy that it's happening. And so when you say, you know, this is going to be a big risk, if you look behind me on that side, climate change, we know that our planet roughly has 20, 30 years and then, then it's gone. It, it might, I don't mean the whole planet is gone. Then the way in which we live is no longer possible. So if we already know this and we have several elections with these facts, I mean, 20 years of several elections with these facts on the table. And people know this is not some hypothetical threat. This is a real threat. This is not something that you can escape from either. Even the filthy rich, their rockets are not good enough yet that they can go to other planets, right? It's the, they're not there yet. And still they don't do it. I mean, what hope do we have that people accept your proposals and then, and who's going to do it? So you say it needs to be a global thing. So we don't have a, a global government, right? We have actually global anarchy instead. And so who's gonna do it? 
Are we going to have to overthrow governments? Everybody, revolution. No, no need to overthrow governments. Uh, very, uh, my, my solution is actually very pacifistic. Um, if we analyze the case of Sweden, I'm going to take Sweden as one of Nordic countries that has actually very stable um, amounts of uh, social welfare and has stable amounts of inequality. Uh, it was not in the top countries due to the fact that there are around 25 billionaires, I believe, according to the last statistics in Sweden. Um, the wealth gap is not that enormous. What happens is the existence of what we in the political sciences call as the uh, welfare state or the social state. All of our states, my state, um, the Republic of North Macedonia has declared itself as a social country, which means that it is a country that is going to uh, one way or another take care of the social problem. The social inequality is a social problem. What happens is that the amount of the, the political elite that is ruling our countries, the, uh, the political elite that are parts of our governments that are creating our laws and policies, are in fact coming not from the lower class, they're coming from the upper class if we're defining them as classes. They're, be, they're members of the wealthier population, which means that the views that they're having uh, in terms of how should the policy be created and how it should be implemented and how it should affect the society as a whole will always be from the standpoint of a privileged position. What we need here is a shift of powers. We need to give powers to the ones that are naturally less vocal, the ones that are naturally given less space in policies. And we need to have a more uh, open-minded and more direct participation of the citizens that would be able to represent and uh, advocate for their interest among the governments. So uh, what we need right now in this position uh, on a global level is actually a global strife for the countries to not just nominally and legally, but also practically be constructed as welfare and social states. That would be that would give us, first of all, the amount to escape the crisis of the degeneration of the society on a first step, and then on the second step, implement all the other um, the other suggestions that I proposed in the last part of the speech. Can I quickly respond? There was once an experiment about 10 years ago in Europe, it was called Greece. And they actually tried to, um, try to reverse a number of the neoliberal policies that made the poor in their country so poor. And do you know what happened? Right, Europe just basically turned the tab, forced them to adopt their neoliberal doctrine. So what we have is we think that EU is okay, but don't ever touch the money of the rich. If you do that, Absolutely. if you do that, then so this is the experiment that you, you, you that you suggested. Also suggest, of course, that without a global takeover, it's never going to happen because Greece, on their own, even as a sovereign nation, could certainly not reverse the neoliberal order. Right. Absolutely. Um, the, the neoliberal um, tendencies have been um, around for like since ever. Uh, we've seen uh, Adam Smith defining the market as something perfect with his invisible hand theory that pushes the rich to the to more richness and the poor to uh, more poverty. Um, that is something that has been accepted. Why? Because the rich, the wealthier class, as I said, benefits from it economically, politically, socially. And since they're being the ruling elite because economic power and wealth power also brings political power, this means that the system, if those the same people remain being the rulers or the guardians of the system uh, only um, to be said so, uh, will never change the system because it benefits them. This is why we need to overturn it. We need a more direct democracy, not a revolution, a more direct democracy where the people, the people that come from the unprivileged positions will be able to have their state as well. Jail the bankers, put them in jail. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, we have just one last question because we are uh, almost out of the time. Uh, so I'll be quick. Uh, I just want to, it's not a really a question. I just want to point out that uh, this topic is extremely important in today's age because we have seen that since the pandemic, the rich got, uh, so before the pandemic, there was a stable growth of inequality. But since the pandemic and uh, all this stuff that's happening around us now, the gap has been like exponentially growing. 
So, and the most money that's being made are uh, for the comp big companies like uh, IT and the media and uh, uh, digital companies. So they're like, we are giving everything to them right now. And uh, it just goes to the, your point that we need to return the power from the, the companies, multinational companies, to the governments and to the people uh, in uh, our countries. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the beautiful presentation and uh, the importance of raising this topic. Thank you.